Okay, let's get started. Uh, first of all, um, I'm really pleased with the nice turnout today, and I'm happy to uh, be hosting Detlev Helmig from the University of Colorado INSTAR. So Detlev uh, got his uh, diploma degree from our in analytical chemistry and then received his PhD at the University of Duisburg in Germany. From there, he went on to do a postdoc at UC Riverside. Then he moved to Colorado where he worked at NCAR. At the time it was ACD and he worked in the BAI group. And then he became a scientist in series. And then in 2001, this is a little anecdotal story, but I became his first graduate student. And we set up the um, ARL or the Atmospheric Research Lab at NSTAR. And so NSTAR is the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research, but it does a lot more than just Arctic and Alpine research, including uh, analysis of organic gases in the atmosphere. Um, so he's been doing that since 2001, and um, let's see, he's also the domain editor-in-chief of the nonprofit Open Access Journal Elementa, which is the science of the Anthropocene. Um, he has, he's also in charge of the, some of the VOCs from FLAS samples from the NOAA uh, network, that, where they bring in FLAS from around the world to analyze different greenhouse gases and um, halocarbons and VOCs. And other, other projects include VOC and ozone monitoring and ozone reactivity at many places around the world, such as the South Pole, Summit Greenland, Zugspitze Mountain in Germany, um, Front Range of Colorado, Niwot Ridge, uh, Northern Michigan. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Detlev, and uh, thanks for coming. Thank you, John. It's nice to be introduced by a former graduate student, and nice to see him do so well and be on a nice trajectory and give a nice introduction speech here. I think if he continues like that, maybe you want to consider running for president someday. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've seen my title, um, many, many good colleagues, some of them actually here in the room, helped me with this work, so I'm just presenting it. I didn't really do a whole lot myself, to be honest, um, but I'll walk you through this today. Um, um, let me see. So... From beginning. Okay, there we go. I've got it to. So it's a different system. Okay, so I'll be talking about um, air quality impacts of oil and gas development. And it's only a sliver when it comes to air quality impacts. There's it's quite a range of pollutants that have been addressed in the context of oil and gas. And I'm listening those there. And really, I'm only going to focus on a few of those today, which are um, fugitive emissions, we call them. So those are gases that get away from where they're supposed to be. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on methane and a compound group called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. And I'm not going to touch a whole lot of these, these other things on the list there. Okay, there we go. And this addresses a group of um, petrochemical hydrocarbons. They're part of the VOCs, or sometimes referred to as non-methane hydrocarbons. Non-methane, because they are not methane. I'll list methane here as well. And I've listed them here by names, as well as of, with their chemical structures. And I think most of you are, are know of these by now. And I've circled them here just to kind of categorize them into natural gas um, hydrocarbons. They're on the left side. And the more the oil-associated uh, VOCs or hydrocarbons, they're on the right side. So when we talk about natural gas, we're mostly talking about the lighter part of the spectrum. And when it's a dry gas, it's mostly shifted towards the methane. If it's a, if it's a wetter gas, then you have more of these somewhat heavier compounds there moving towards the oil. Um, it it's moving more towards these um, higher molecular white molecules. There's no real firm, strict transition. So what you see out there is kind of a mixture um, of all of this, more or less of one or the other. Okay, and um, 
most of you have seen this by now. Um, what this entails these days is a lot of these topics, issues that evolve around um, hydraulic fracturing, which is a fairly new um, technique for um, assessing oil or gas reservoirs. And in contrast to the old-fashioned conventional um, drilling techniques where pretty extensive reservoirs were accessed um, underground, um, when it comes to fracking, um, it's it mostly um, uh, a technique that tries to access reservoirs that are, the oil and gas is kind of within formations that need to be fractured um, to access them. And what, what it differentiates it from the um, um, traditional technique is that it's a somewhat more intensive technique where the amount of product that's produced is relatively small in relation to the activity that has to happen um, at the surface. And that has um, had some impacts, um, as most of you know by now. Um, but it has, <laughs> it has caused a surge in um, oil and gas production. These are some um, production figures um, on the left side, U.S. oil production. You can see how it's increased um, very significantly over the last 15 years. Um, the number of oil rigs has gone up very significantly over that time frame as well. And down there you have um, the production numbers for natural gas, and it's, it's all gone up. And there's um, a lot of um, many um, economical benefits from that, as you know. Um, so when I have to drive the countryside and you know, my, my kids know I'm working on this topic. I'd say, oh, look, there's fracking. I said, no, this is not fracking. They see something like that. That's not fracking. That's a, that's a producing well. Um, in order to understand the impact of fracking and the extent of it, um, we're talking about facilities like this. So this is a much larger industrial scale operation with um, machinery, with... Uh, vehicles, trucks, with pumps, with compressors. Very often there's power generation at the side. So you can see it's a major industrial facility operation. Okay, and there's a, there's a few more pictures here just to show you, um, to emphasize the extent and the intensity of these um, fracking operations. Okay, and this has moved into our neighborhoods. Um, some of you have seen this. These are pictures right here from um, um, Boulder and Weld County. And as, as many of you have seen from reading the papers, it at times um, approaches places where people live. Like this residence here in, in Windsor near Greeley is actually um, Sean Stein up there. I've, I've met her. Um, she, she lives right there, and there's a fracking operation right in her backyard. Um, and there's a lot of um, heavy equipment um, operation in and out. And <laughs> this is an amazing number. You know, there's 200,000 truck entries scheduled in and out this um, right next to a property over the next 30 years. Um, and, you know, once wells are established, you have situations like down there where you have producing wells in close proximity to um, people's residences. And that has caused, you know, some concern some some issues, some tension, as you know. Um, and um, we've all been following that. Um, again, this shows the intensity of um, the oil and gas development in our um, local region here. You can see this, the front range of Colorado. Um, brown dots are established wells, and the green and the um, bluish markers represent um, permits and um, approved to be drilled facility. So it's, um, it's a still currently expanding industry. And it's something that's still growing as we speak. Okay, so we started working on the local scale um, around 2013, 2014. Um, as most of you remember, there was the um, Front range air pollution and photochemistry experiment, FRAPE, and we had two different uh, measurement programs ongoing during the time. And um, what we did is we ran a number of sites through the summer 2014. One was a transect from up the mountains, Continental Divide, into town, 
And another one from town to these eastern sites here where we sampled every week for several days. So overall, we got data represented on the order of 40 days. So this is a good um, data set that represents a, what we call a transect. So it's a change in concentration um, on a geographical scale. Okay? And the data are down here. Um, the left graph shows the transect here coming down from the mountains. And the right graph shows going from Boulder out towards these eastern sites. And what I'm showing here are the uh, statistical results for ethane, which you remember the earlier slides, you know, is that the um, second most abundant um, hydrocarbon in natural gas. And as you clearly can see, these graphs that show the statistical distribution, where this is the median concentration of all data, this is the mean, and then this is the 25 percentile, this 75 percentile, somewhere here, this is the median. So as you go down the mountains, concentrations of ethane go up. There's also higher variability. That means at times you see very high levels, but you see also lower concentration um, on other occasions. And again, as you go further out here towards these, these eastern sites, same story in Boulder. It's relatively a um, narrow distribution, but then the distribution gets wider and wider, and you get higher and higher concentrations uh, further out with the highest levels here at um, Stephen Park, uh, Park, which is a park um, in East Longmont. <coughs> okay, so that first graph showed ethane. Um, again, that's up here for going from town towards eastern Boulder County. And um, then I'm adding here some more of these petrochemical hydrocarbons. This is propane, isobutane, and butane. Um, as you can see, very similar behavior. You know, as you move towards the eastern part of the county, concentration goes up, go up and the, um, the spread goes up. Very, very consistent for these um, natural gas hydrocarbons. Also have benzene here, which is not quite as clear. There's you know, much more of a variability and somewhat more consistent levels throughout the county. And then what I'm having here is something uh, a bit different. I want to explain this to you, and I'm, because I'm going to be using that quite a bit. This is the ratio of two hydrocarbons, and it's the ratio of isopentane to n-pentane. So these are isomers of the same molecular weight molecule. This is isopentane, and this is n-pentane. And it's really a, a beautiful tracer. And Jessica Gilman, I think, was the first one to really jump on that and point this out. Turns out that when you look at the relative ratio of these compounds, they really give you a very specific signature of the type of emission source you have. And there's these, these nice graphs that were published in two papers that show that if you plot the I-pentane over N-pentane ratio, and if you are in an oil and gas dominated area, it's a very tight correlation and the slope of this relationship is just slightly below one, 0 0.9, 0 0.85. Whereas if you look at urban samples that are mostly influenced by you know, other sources, of these pentane isomers, you get a quite higher ratio. It goes all the way up to two or three. Like this is data from Pasadena, and this is data from um, the Boulder Atmospheric Observatory out in Erie. So this ratio now has been used quite extensively to characterize air of its um, signature. Is it more urban-influenced air, or is it more oil and gas-influenced air? where the, the cutoff or the transition is somewhere on the order of 1.5. So when this ratio drops below 1.5, we can kind of claim this is heavily influenced by oil and gas. If it's higher than that, yeah, it's probably not much oil and gas in there. <laughs> okay, so given this stack gradient we found in Boulder County in the 2014 study, um, we were wondering, and, and, and others were wondering, you know, what's the source strength, what's the influence of these oil and gas sources on air quality here within our region, within our county, and Boulder County Public Health um, funded a study um, to us at the Boulder Reservoir. So I'm going to walk you through this right now. So it's the 
Boulder Reservoir Air Quality Monitoring. And there's a site right here at the southeastern tip of the reservoir. There's a small shed. The shed actually is um, operated by, by CDPHE, but they're um, accommodating us. And we started this in early 2017. And we're monitoring gases at this facility, and these include methane, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and then this whole suite of VOCs here, these petrochemical hydrocarbon VOCs going from ethane all the way to benzene, toluene, and these um, xylenes. And then ozone is measurement is measured there as well. And let me see if I can make this work here. Okay, so, um, whoops. So there's a website. Uh, there's a website that describes the program, and also what it does is um, it reports the data. You know, I'm, I'm very happy and proud that um, we figured out how to put these measurements right online um, in pretty much real time. So there's some automated routines, protocols that process the data, they calculate concentrations from the raw data, and they dump them on the site. And it's a public site, so all of you can go there and look up um, what's the methane today at the Boulder Reservoir. And as you can see, today is Monday afternoon. This has been updated just a uh, half an hour ago or something. So this is how methane wiggled around at the reservoir today. And um, so what's on this side is, whoops, where are we now? So this is uh, methane, and it shows uh, roughly the regional background. So anything above that is kind of an enhancement of the day. Um, same for some of these hydrocarbons, um, ethane and propane. And you can see already, wow, it really jumps up and down quite a bit, just the last three days. And there's a lot of variability. So we have ethane and propane. We have the butane isomers. We have acetylene. <laughs> Then we have these pentane isomers that I just um, explained to you. Um, then here we have the pentane ratio that's calculated on the fly. Um, so from there you can tell, well, how heavily are we influenced today by oil and gas versus um, you know, other urban background sources. You can see you know, the last few days um, um, the oil and gas influence has been somewhat um, lower. Then we're having um, benzene and toluene there as well. Um, then we're also um, showing the records for nitrogen oxide, uh, nitric oxide and um, NOx. And then down here, um, we're also plotting the wind speed and the wind direction. So if you're curious, hey, where's the air blowing from today? So it's all um, there together, the same side, pretty much you know, within real time and I'm available for anybody who's interested in this. So where do I put this here? Uh, it's a bit, I'm working with two screens here, and I've never done this. Um, I lost this. I'm trying to get this all out of the way. Oops. I just want to close this because I don't need it anymore. There we go. Okay, so so that's the website. And oops, now I get to click on this here. I lost totally lost my. Okay. Oops. I have a little bit of a, a little bit of an issue here because um, I still see everything right here, but I lost the screen. I don't know what I did wrong here. I don't lost totally lost my <laughs> totally lost my where is it? Totally lost my cursor. Oh, there it is. From current slide. Oops. Yeah. There we go. Okay. There we go back. Oops, no. Okay, that's where we stopped it. Okay, so I want to sh um, walk you through data from this monitoring. And it started in um, 
February, roughly this year. Um, so a few stats. We've taken oh, close to 30,000 measurements of methane by now. Um, so methane is analyzed every 14 minutes. Um, Non-methane hydrocarbons, close to 3,500 measurements. Um, it's run every um, two hours, roughly. NOx, you know, it's a high number, 90-some thousands. And, and also what's amazing, this website I just showed you, it's been visited 8,400 times or something. They're shocked that there's that much interest, that much attention being paid to this monitoring. So now this is all of the methane um, we've been gathering so far. So again, this is statistical distribution um, by month. So each month is something like four or 500 data points. Again, this shows the median, the mean, the spread between the 25th and 75th percentile. So you can see from when we started to um, last month, it's gone up quite a bit, um, probably a factor of two. But I don't want to um, mislead you you know, and saying FN is going up. Um, given where we are and, and what's happening is, you know, it's, it's, it's winter. There's, the conditions here have changed a lot. In the winter, we typically have much more, much higher abundance of stable atmospheric conditions. The mixing layer, what we call, is, is not as deep. So this is probably mostly driven by a much weaker mixing of the atmosphere. This has been, been known pretty well. Um, so, but we are... You know, we're seeing at least a factor of two, two to three um, changes just by the season um, driven by atmospheric mixing conditions. So this is ethane um, over the year. Then what do we have here? So we have broken this up um, in the diurnal changes in ethane. Again, the medians are this, these, these dots here in the middle. You can see typically ethane, you know, it's going to be a little bit higher at night. It drops during the day, and again, this is mostly driven by mixing because the atmosphere mixes more vigorously during the day, and then it goes up again um, in, the, in the late evening. This is the data broken up by day of um, week, um, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way through Saturday. And something um, that's been done in the literature for a long, long time to look at you know, how much are air contaminant levels um, driven by activities, people activities. And, and most times when we look at um, pollution from um, transportation, cars, trucks, we see a really stark um, drop on the weekends because there's not as much traffic. We don't see that here. You know, ethane and propane, um, ethane is pretty much as high on a Saturday, on a Sunday as on any other day. So it's very clear this is not driven by... Um, people moving around or sleeping in and staying home and watching football or something. Um, so now what I'm doing here is um, I take the data from the Boulder Reservoir and I compare them with a very nice study, beautiful study, but it was published actually quite a number of years ago um, by the UC Irvine group. Um, there's some pretty um, um, famous people on this, um, Sherry Rowland, he got a Nobel Prize um, ways back, um, Donald Blake, so some very highly recognized colleagues. And what they did is they um, measured these VOCs, similar ones we're doing here, for several years in um, major U.S. cities, 28 United States cities, and they published the average concentrations. And those are listed here you know, by increasing average mean concentration. You can see these are all pretty big, big cities. Um, and this is data from 1999 to 2004. And then I've put the Boulder Reservoir data right here. So if you compare what we've seen so far at the Boulder Reservoir with these 28 U.S. cities, we're at the high end of what was reported. And this, which in my, as far as I know, is about the most extensive survey study of these hydrocarbons in urban areas. Now, this was some 15 years ago. And in the meantime, these light hydrocarbons, they've actually dropped in most urban areas because of air quality regulations. And if I use um, an average trend that was reported in Los Angeles, so the changes in Los Angeles between that time window to right now, then for these urban areas, these levels drop actually quite significantly. 
And that's, I think, you know, somewhat more valid comparison than comparing the Boulder Reservoir with this older data. And so on that scale, the Boulder Reservoir data here, um, what we've measured the last 10 months, is, you know, at the, the highest, oops, the highest compared to all of these urban areas that were considered in that, um, that study. <coughs> um, so that was ethane, um, which is, you know, a primary oil and gas emission that has very little um, sources or very weak sources, only weak sources outside of oil and gas. I um, want to show you data for benzene because there's a lot of interest in benzene because benzene is a different type of compound having um, much more severe and direct health impacts. Um, so we're taking very close at benzene and watching that and many others are. So this is the... Um, um, the, the record we have for benzene so far. And again, you can see it, it's slightly going up, moving towards the winner. Um, this is the cumulative distribution, which shows you, you know, the way to read this is that, um, you know, 50% of the data of benzene were below 0 0.1.5 ppb or something. I also put on here um, the World Health Organization 1 over 100,000 lifetime cancer health threshold, which is 0 0.5 ppb. So if you breathe your lifelong this concentration, you know, your risk of cancer, according to these, these um, studies, increases by 1 over 100,000. So, and I, you know, I didn't put this on there, but if you compare that with these other urban areas that I showed in the earlier slide, benzene is you know, significantly lower um, in relation to these other urban areas, and also these levels that we see mostly fall below this, this health threshold. Um, what's um, remarkable, again, I would say that in comparison to other data I've seen, benzene doesn't really drop on Saturday, Sundays. Um, you know, it's a typical transportation sector emission, and it doesn't show that type of behavior. So we see really steady levels um, throughout the week. These are some relationships we see in the data. Ethane versus methane. See a pretty <coughs> excuse me, tight correlation here, which indicates that they likely have similar common emission sources or transported from you know, similar regions, emission regions. Um, if you look at ethane versus this I and pentane relationship, we can see that you know there's in generally higher ethane when the signature moves towards the oil and gas signature here, which is not surprising since ethane is primary oil and gas. Um, same with methane. You know we see the highest methane values on average when we have this high oil and natural gas signature, you could read it such that probably most of the methane we're seeing here is related to oil and gas sources rather than to other potential methane sources that there are. And this is benzene against this relationship. And it also shows that, you know, we, we generally see um, somewhat higher benzene when the air has this oil and natural gas signature. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a whole set of graphs. Um, there are these, these wind roses here. So what we do is we look at the concentration at a given time and what was the wind direction when we measured at that moment. <coughs> so and these plots will include all the data between May and December, but we filtered the wind direction data for wind speeds when winds were higher than three meters per second. And that the, the motivation for that is that that gives us a more reliable wind direction. When the winds are really weak, the wind wane, it flips around, and the wind direction is not so um, well defined. So we just focus on, excuse me, the higher wind speeds, which gives us just a better, more certain uh, data analysis. So again, these data were from here, the Boulder Reservoir, and you have to think about yourself, put this right here in the middle, and then these, these pies here, 
you know, they, def they show, you know, the direction from where the winds came. Um, so you need to kind of look at what's within a certain sector that, that corresponds to this pie. Yeah, so if you go um, south, southwest, you have the city of Boulder with some 100,000 people. <coughs> if you go to the um, north, northeast, you have Longmont. But there's a good stretch where there isn't much in between. Diagonal Highway is right here. If you go straight east, you're kind of getting to Erie. And then Denver, and that's an important thing to remember, big, big city of Denver, it's, it's in the south, um, southeastern part right here. Okay, so uh, this is going to disappear with the next slide. So try to remember what is where. And then this, this oil and gas development region, it's mostly this sector here. Yeah. So now the, the way to read this, the size of this pie, all that really shows is how often did the winds come from this direction? It's just the frequency of the wind, nothing else. Yeah? And you can see this really interesting, amazing situation we have here. We get a lot of winds right from the west, northwest to southwest, a lot of the winds. And then we get a lot of the winds from the northeast. That's all this says. Yeah? We rarely get wind from Denver or the east. Yeah? Very rarely, very defined wind directional preference here. Yeah? So that's all just about the pies. Now, on top of the pies, are, now in the color scale, are the levels or, or mixing ratios, concentrations of different type of species that I will show you right now. So we start out with methane. So you can see when the winds are from the west or even from, from the south and even from um, Denver, mostly, mostly blues. So these are the lower levels of methane. And then when the winds come from this sector here, we have a good fraction of higher elevated levels of methane, where it gets, you know, at least uh, 5, 10% higher than from the other sectors. So this was methane. Now we're going to ethane. Ethane is a much more selective um, tracer for oil and gas activities. Um, since methane has, you know, quite a few other um, sources. So the, the distribution of the winds, that stays the same. You know, in the same place, same, same set of data, but the colors all change and the concentration scale changes. So as you can see, again, ethane, you know, it's really high preference or high, much higher abundance of elevated ethane levels um, and transport winds are from this sector, whereas, you know, almost only background levels, this dark blue here, only see when winds are from the west, um, much lower ethane, western transport. And also when, when there's winds from the east, straight east, or the south east, where there's um, the city of Denver, um, relatively low ethane. Okay, benzene. Again, benzene, actually quite, quite similar. And that was quite surprising. You know, you have a city of 100,000 people down here, with lots of cars, lots of activities, some industries, um, but we don't see much um, elevated benzene coming from the city. Most of the elevated benzene comes from the northeast, just as with methane and ethane. Um, then this is the total, we call it total VOCs. So we take all of these hydrocarbons that we currently measure and we, we prorate them by the number of carbons in the molecule. Um, so then we get a total parts per billion carbon. <coughs> and, um, you know, you see something very similar, um, high levels, transport air from the northeast, even um, when air is transported from the from the Denver metro area, um, we don't really see a whole lot of organic carbon being transported from that sector. Um, so now here I plot this um, isomeric ratio of the pentanes. You see much uh, more interesting distribution of the colors. So when I explained this earlier, I was saying, you know, 1.5 is about the cutoff where these reddish yellow colors, they're more background urban ratios of these isomers. And you can see here now we have you know, a lot of this from the west. So when, when there's transport from the west, even from the city of um, 
older, um, the mostly urban background um, signatures of these paintings, whereas when the um, air is transported from the northeastern portion, you know, we see very strong dominant oil and gas signature. Okay, and now this is nitrogen oxides. Um, you can see this, to be careful reading this now, because again, the, the, the size of the pie um, only you know, is the wind distribution, not, not the levels you really see. So, so when you look at the western portion, you know, you only have a small sliver of these higher levels. Now, in this case, when air comes from Boulder, Denver, you know, most of this, fractionally, most of this now is in the yellow, brownish, reddish, meaning that we get high, we get elevated, relatively higher levels of NOx in this transport. Um, but also, um, when air is from the northeast, um, you know, we get levels that are not quite as high as from the urban areas, but they do have... Um, um, rather elevated NOx levels there as well. Okay, so um, when we went to the website, um, Audio gave you a clue that these, these hydrocarbons jump around a lot, and there's a, a lot of uh, variability up and down, and we've been watching this for nine months now, getting used to it, um, and this is a well, I shouldn't call it typical example. It's the extreme example. And we noticed that it was right before Christmas. Um, we had highly elevated um, levels of um, ethane, propane, you know, and everything else. That's the hydrocarbon jumped up. Also benzene, toluene. And this is, whew, actually, I looked at this and I sent out an email. Wow, look at this, 120 ppb of ethane. That's really, really high. Other than in the Uinta Basin, I've done some work. I've never seen this much ethane before. So this was striking. And if you look closely, you know, so this, this goes together with this here. Um, there was actually, it started really, really low. We heard, you know, uh, the, the, the background signature, and then bang, it took a nosedive. We had a very strong oil and gas signature. And so well, what was going on? Um, winds actually were for about so eight, nine hours, right from the northeast to the east, and then it dr quickly dropped back to um, <coughs> western winds. So, yeah, look, look, look neat, didn't think about it too much. And then I got an email a few days later <coughs> with somebody um, asking me, hey, did you hear about this oil well blowing up in Windsor? Um, did you see anything in Boulder? I said, well, no, I don't know. You know, why would we see this in Boulder? You know, we're some 40 miles away from Windsor. Um, so I hadn't even thought about that. I didn't even know about this. I hadn't read that in the paper. So it was a major explosion, and it happened on December 22nd, 9 p.m. Um, made the news over in Windsor, and the Denver Post covered it as well. And actually, a worker got injured. So then when I got this, I said, well, let's, let's look at our data again. Um, so where was the air coming from? So you just saw the spike. And the spike, you know, happened on December 22nd um, in the evening. Friday, December 22nd, about uh, 6, 7, 8 p.m., something in that range. And this happened the same day, 9 p.m. So would we see this? while it's blowing up? Probably not, because we are 40 miles away. And if this blows up, there's a fire. Even if it's oil and gas, it burns. You know, most of that turns into CO2. We wouldn't really expect it. But then when we looked at the um, back trajectory, so what we did is we took um, the time when this spike happened, and we ran what's called back trajectory, which analyzes what transport did the air take during that time. So what we have here is for 5 p.m., 7 p.m., 9 p.m., um, we ran these back trajectories and these numbers give you basically the transport in hours. You know, so if you look at 5 p.m. at the Boulder Reservoir, an hour earlier the air was here, two hours earlier it was here, and then you go back. <coughs> Excuse me. And for those of you who work in this field, you know, 
you know, back trajectories, they are useful, they're helpful, but they're only so good. You know, they have really high, un they have uncertainty. The uncertainty increases the further you go back. And being here at the border front range, back trajectories are even you know, more uncertain than if you were out in, let's say, in Kansas or somewhere, because the air transport here has so many local features. But they give you an idea, and the fact that we have three trajectories here that all give us a very similar flow pattern um, adds some sort of confidence to this. And now, um, when we did this, we, we were quite amazed because th this is the site of the explosion here. Um, and, you know, the, the, so the uncertain range of these, you know, will probably go widen as, as the transport goes back in time. So there's a quite reasonable overlap between the airflow pattern on that day and the site of the explosion. Um, so, but now, what you gotta also remember is there's some time delay. So, we, we saw this event here around this time. Now, you, and that was, you know, coincident when that explosion happened. Now, if you go back this, you can, you know, the air that, that we saw around that time originated in this general area, probably on the order of six to nine to 12 hours prior to that. So if that's really related, and I'm not saying it is, but it would make a, it makes a really nice, interesting case study, you know, that would imply that there were highly elevated um, levels of these um, oil and gas hydrocarbons um, in this region. And we, we saw them six, seven, eight hours later. So that means, you know, if, if you link this to this explosion, it would have been there, you know, early in the day, in the morning um, to mid-morning mid hours. And also, so these were the highest levels we've seen at the Boulder Reservoir throughout this entire study. In 3,000 some measurements, these were the highest measurements we've seen. Um, also would mean that along this path, these levels probably were even um, significantly higher since as air gets transported and travels along, you know, and it does dilute over time, especially during the daytime. This was daytime transport where the mixed layer is typically somewhat deeper. Um, so it's a very interesting case study and a possible association to an event that um, caught quite some attention in the news. Okay, good. I want to move on. Um, um, for those of you working in this field, they you know, also know that VOCs factor into ozone production, and I'm just going to touch it um, with two slides here. This is um, for the Boulder Reservoir, the August record of ozone measurements last year, where the blue data show the day, the hourly medians, and the, um, the open circles show you know, all the the um, data points at that given hour for the whole month. And you can see, you know, at uh, times we, we exceed um, in the hourly data what's defined at the, as the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for ozone, which is 70 ppb. So that's, you know, been discussed um, and looked at widely. Um, and I don't want to go there. I don't have the time today. Um, I want to show this quite nice association, which is, um, this is a beautiful study by CDPHE that looks at the source footprint of elevated ozone that was observed at these four monitoring sites here. And I kind of aligned these two maps so they show the same area. And what's striking is that, you know, the area that has the highest oil and gas development um, also um, uh, has a lot of common footprint with what was identified as the source region for this elevated ozone. Um, it's a very intensive field of research. A lot of progress has been made there over the last uh, two, three years. There's a series of um, publications I've listed here that just came out the last two years. And um, yeah, so it's a, um, from a health perspective, you know, a very um, interesting and um, 
potentially concerning association between the oil and gas emissions and an air quality index. So I'm pretty far along in my talk, um, and I should be wrapping up. Um, but I have another 20 slides, which is um, too much to go through. Um, so what I've been talking about so far is, is local, right here at our front steps. You know, Boulder Reservoir is just a couple miles from where we are right now. Um, we have another field of research where we look at the distribution of these hydrocarbons on the global scale. And um, I'm going to do this really quick to um, save some time for questions. Um, so we're getting air from around the world, all these places on this, this map here. Every week, um, air comes to us in glass flasks. It's put in these flasks. You know, this is one of the sides. There's another side in Greenland. Uh, it comes to our lab in these bottles or flasks. We run it on an instrument. We run all these um, hydrocarbons in there. Been doing this for 12 years. Just added a few more in there as well. And then um, if you look at the changes over time, so this is uh, 10, 11 years of data from a site in Iceland, and you can see these, these, this is ethane again. It goes up and down, up and down every year. And this is not because emissions change throughout the year. This is driven by photochemistry um, because in the summer these, these hydrocarbons break down much, much faster because it's much more... Um, solar-induced photochemical reactivity in the air. Um, we do this around the world. We look at the um, distribution of these compounds around the world. This is ethane, uh, 11, 12 years of ethane. You can see the, um, this is um, from the South Pole to the North Pole, much, much lower levels in the Southern Hemisphere. And, um, you know, the further north you go, the higher these, these um, hydrocarbons get. Uh, so this is ethane. Do this um, for about a dozen compounds <coughs> altogether. Um, very similar features, very consistent patterns. Um, then what I wanted to show here real quick is um, taking that data, which is just all here, just the last 10, 15 years, then other data that's been used, that's been um, gathered from this old air, and old air we get from, from fern air, which is air sucked out of deep, deep snowpack, and ice cores. This is data from ice cores. Um, so this goes ways, ways back in time. We, we, we have a good understanding now about the history, the history of how these hydrocarbons have changed in the atmospheres. So for ethane in the northern hemisphere, before industries really kicked in, <coughs> Excuse me. It was on the order of 500 parts per trillion. It climbed up to about nine, um, around 2,000 in the 1970s, 80s, and it's come down. It's come down um, a lot, actually, by about a quarter, just in the last 40 years. Um, and it's very similar for other hydrocarbons. Um, so we're... We're at a phase where we were looking at 40 years of declining concentrations of these light hydrocarbons. Um, and then when we looked at the data closer, just a few years ago, we, we actually noticed that, well, the very latest few years, this behavior has changed again. And um, um, we, did, we, we, we compared quite a number of different data sets, and what's highly valuable there is data from the Arctic because you're so far away from pollution sur sources that you get about the cleanest signal. And if you look at this data from Summit, it's very obvious that there's been an increase just in the last six, seven years. Um, these are the, the rates of increase. So this is a, a, a trend on the order of um, f four or five percent upwards trends in the last um, few years. And um, if you do this, on a global scale, um, this is data, each, each dot represents a measurement site. You notice that you know, most of these dots in the northern hemispheres are in the orange and reddish, which on this scale means there's a positive trend, which means these hydrocarbons have been increasing over this time frame there. Um, um, so after 40 years of declining concentrations, over the last few years, 
there has been a reversal. So concentrations are increasing again. And this has been now very well established. Um, and the rate of increase is on the order of 3 to 4%. And at that inc rate of increase, this drop that we saw over this 40-year period will be compensated or made up again in, on the order of 10 years. And um, if you look at a shorter-lived hydrocarbon, and this is uh, propane, C3H8, and do the same analysis, you can see that the hotspot, the global hotspot of this increase appears to be the, the central to eastern United States, whereas on the west coast, the yellow colors, they're not really um, indicating increases. And, um, and that's the, the region of the, um, um, that overlaps with most of the oil and gas growth. Um, industry growth that we've seen over that period. So um, I think that that's been pretty well accepted now. There's been a, a few papers um, showing that this, this fast increase in growth of the North American oil and gas industry has not just had effects on the local scale, but we also see it on a hemispheric scale um, where ethane has been going up um, and this is a very significant global flux um, that I'm listing here. So it's about a two teragram increase in ethane over this time period, um, equivalent to about six teragrams increase in total non-methane hydrocarbon. And if you use ethane-methane relationship, you can also infer an um, increase in methane from this growth. So um, what we're seeing here on the local regional scale is also reflected on a much larger hemispheric scale. And I had a few more slides, but I think um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, it's my last slide, just to show you know, this is a, a hot topic <laughs> on many scales, on the regional scale, local scale. We're doing this right here at our footsteps. Um, but it's also garnered a lot of attention um, around the world because these, these increases in these hydrocarbon emissions have implications on ozone, on carbon monoxide in the atmosphere, or methane in the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a very exciting period to do science, do research, because there's, there's some real changes, there are things happening. And um, it's also nice to see the public is really interested in the work we're doing, which uh, makes it much more fun um, for us as scientists. So thanks, everybody, for coming and for listening. Oh, thank you, Doug, for the nice talk. <laughs> We're supposed to use the microphone. I, guess it's... I don't hear an echo. It's a small room. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the reason I'm using the microphone is because some people are viewing online and they want to hear the questions, so we'll do our best. But anyway, so anyway, questions? I'll, I'll let you pick whoever you want. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, what do you anticipate to be the future status of funding for this type of research, considering the political environment? <laughs> Thanks for asking that question. <laughs> so we've been... So our... I showed you this map, but the, the global VOC monitoring Actually, we, well, this is NOAA Global Monitoring Division in my lab. We run this global network, and this is the one, the only network. There's no other group, no other nation that does that. We've been doing it for 12 years, and that generates these data, um, these blue, these red dots. We've been doing this for 12 years. We just got hammered with a 50% cut to cut this program back just this year. Um, this is the only program that generates these data. This is the um, program that generates these data. This is what we're doing. Um, we got to cut it. It's, we've got to take some sites out, or instead of doing it every week, doing it only every other week. Um, so that's my own experience, part of one. And then, um, 
where's that other slide? So that's the red dots. The black dots, it's another program where we actually at Summit in Greenland. Oops, it was a picture. Um, where is it? Here. So we have a system actually sitting in this building and it's measuring exactly these ethane and these other hydrocarbons. It's measuring every hour or two. I've been doing this for eight years. It was cut. Well, it's gone. It's basically gone. Um, the funding ran out. It wasn't renewed. Um, so that's from my perspective, how this funding looks right now. So we've been hammered the last year. Two of our major programs that support this research have been cut. Um, luckily and happily, Boulder County Public Health is funding this Boulder Reservoir Study. It's ongoing, it's online, you can watch the data. And that's funded through um, um, the fall this year. So this will be alive and will run to the fall, and I don't know what's going to happen there. So from my own perspective, it's been a really bad year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't see a change anytime soon. But you know, I've been in this field for 30 years, and whew, it's a roller coaster. My whole life, career has been a roller coaster. It goes up and down, so you know, I'm not pessimistic on the long run, long term. Um, I'm optimistic that it will turn around again. Thanks for asking that question. <laughs> yeah, please. I have two questions. The first is, do you know what accounts for the decline in VOCs um, since the 80s? Very, yeah, very good question. And I would have talked about this, but gosh, I, I, I talk way too much. Um, so yeah, it relates to this. So and we, we actually, we see this not just for, you know, we see it for ethane, propane, isobutane, androgen, uh -huh. a lot of these. And this is, this is rock solid. This has been done by two, three groups. I think we have about the, you know, one of the nicest data sets and a nice paper on that. And I think what happened is, is several things. Um, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, oil and gas industry focused mostly on um, exploration of oil, not so much gas. And gas was vented. Um, for the most part, and then natural gas become more of a valuable product in the 60s, 70s. So at some point, the industry said, oh, you know, we actually can make money on gas, so they will prep it. And flaring uh, kicked in, so gas, instead of being released, as um, these hydrocarbons was burned to CO2, and then you don't see it as ethane. Um, that much anymore. And then um, if you go to the more heavier compounds here, um, you know, they're actually also um, emissions from automobiles, exhaust, and this turnaround kind of matches the time when catalytic inverters um, were introduced. So the tailpipe emissions of uh, not so much ethane, but butane, pentane, hexanes, they, they took a total nosedive after the catalytic inverters were introduced. So the, the automobile exhaust, if you compare the exhaust these days with what your grandparents drove, it's a factor of 100, something like that. It's amazing, it's amazing. And actually, if you look at this closely, the ethane actually peaked in the 70s. It looks almost the same, but, but the, 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 the heavier the compounds get, the later this peak is. So that indicates that you know the, the changes that drove the reversal in the ethane were probably of a different nature than the changes that were implemented that kicked in these um, heavier hydrocarbons. OK, yes, back there. Yeah. Um, yeah, also a very good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, at the very beginning, you know, I had a table that listed different types and groups of compounds that have been 
um, addressed, studied, raised concerns as part of oil and gas emissions operations. And, you know, I addressed a fraction of those today. And um, the reason I addressed those are um, that these hydrocarbons, VOCs, they heavily factor into the ozone production. And on a larger s spatial scale, on a regional scale, um, ozone is probably, I would say, the number one um, health impact of oil and gas development because it affects a large number of people. You know, the whole front range here, the Colorado front range, is a non-attainment with the um, ozone standard, and it's been a non-attainment for some uh, 10 plus years now. And there's 2 million people living here or something like that. So it affects a lot, a lot of people. There's a lot of um, urgency to um, bring ozone down in the region. And there's, there's um, research done, and there's, there's you know, slivers of funding available to study that. And uh, my group has been a traditional VOC group. And it, it, f it ties nicely together with the global network um, research we're doing. Um, so these, these, these hydrocarbons, you know, they, they link closely to the elevated ozone um, topic. Um, I touched a little bit, and that's why I had a number of slides on benzene. And it's not just benzene. I only showed benzene, but we're, you know, in the, in the same study, in the same runs. We look at uh, several other compounds, and they're typically grouped as BTEX compounds, um, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylenes. And they're a group that um, have more of a direct health impact on, on people because there are carcinogens. And there really is no um, safe threshold for these BTEX compounds. You know, you really want to get them as low as you can uh, to reduce the risk of people um, to get affected by them. Um, so we do cover um, the... Um, the aromatic compounds, the BTEX compounds, and it's part of the motivation, Boulder County, um, because a, a bit of the dilemma in regulating these hydrocarbon oil and gas emissions is that, that there are no stringent health thresholds for ethane or propane. Um, so even you know 120 parts per billion of ethane, if we see those, and if your neighbor has an operation that exposes you to 120 parts PPB of ethane, nobody's breaking the law, <laughs> you know? And there's, there's no regulation that will kick in right away. But if um, the, the ozone <coughs> um, standards gets exceeded, you know, the EPA regulations that require action to, um, to mitigate these, the elevated ozone occurrences and the precursors to, to ozone. Um, the last part of your question, I think, addressed sulfur compounds, and there <laughs> has been quite a bit of interest. I've received quite a number of, of emails over the last months on that. Um, and I think that um, connects to uh, the issue of order complaints that have been in the news and um, been a topic in the Erie area. Um, you know, the, the research community I'm part of rarely looks at H2S, um, sulfur-containing compounds, because in our traditional field of research, they don't really you know, play a major role. Um, so we haven't paid much attention to them. Um, also, we don't typically have instrumentation and calibra calibration procedures that allows us to just go out and measure them and capture them. Um, they have been described really well in you know, workplace environments, and so they are, they're pretty well understood and known in terms of their, their health impacts and health thresholds. Um, I wouldn't say it's a neglect from our part. Um, it's more the consequence of a number of factors that just happened to align together, because we, we typically don't, we don't, you don't see them, you know, unless to, to, to You've got to have a very selective, specific sensor to measure, let's say, H2S. And that you can't get at McGuckin's. You've got to buy that, and it's going to cost real money. You know, a good H2S sensor, it's $50,000 plus, and you need good standards. 
we haven't done it. We typically don't do this. Nobody has asked us, nobody has funded us to do that. So we haven't paid much attention to it. Yes, please. Um, I don't have, yeah, good question, <laughs> very valid question. I don't have the thresholds for acute exposure, um, and that's a concern with um, increasing proximity to operations, as you can well tell, and, you know, you, from these hopes, you know, it, it does raise concerns because, you know, this data shows so nicely that, you know, this burst, that, you know, there was, I'm not sure it was a controlled and accidental release of these, these hydrocarbons, but it clearly was associated with the release of benzene, um, toluene, and I don't, I promise you there's ethyl benzene, there's xylenes, they all go together. It's like your fingers, they all move together. Um, so we see, you know, in this peak, 0.8 parts per billion at the reservoir, and I'm pretty sure we are 30, 40, 50 miles away from where this was released. So, you know, populations that live closer to this um, source, you know, most certainly were exposed, A, to higher levels, and B, for longer periods of times, most likely. So, but... Um, that Yes, back there. What about the ozone? Uh, you had a slide looking at the ozone levels at the Boulder Reservoir relative to the non-attainment. Is there, uh, in the work that you've done with the transects of air quality, are there information further east of Boulder Reservoir for ozone to see where the concentrations are relative to the, the point of non-attainment? Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, any of that data? Actually, I, I, I do. <laughs> uh, oh, if I'd only known anticipated the question. We actually have a publication in the pipeline that analyzes ozone data from 80 places in Colorado. I was actually very surprised. We were able to find ozone historical records from 80 different places in Colorado, and we've looked at, you know, how does ozone compare across the state in terms of how much is formed in the summer, how aggressively it's formed, what's the mean, median, the statistical distribution, and so forth. Um, so what we see, uh, let me see, where, where would I show this? Um, I need a map. Uh, it's, uh, this is, even that's not the map. So what we see, very interestingly, uh, this is a whole other talk. Um, if you go into the, the central urban areas, actually ozone is still relatively modest. And the highest ozone you see along the front range, right at the, the foothills, um, Fort Collins, um, 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 Golden, um, Chatfield Reservoir, um, then there's a site here near the airport, um, and, and um, also Greeley has pretty high ozone. Um, so within Colorado, the front range has the, about the highest LO highest ozone. We have a whole range of sites down here that are very well documented. Unfortunately, there's only really one site in this whole, well, a couple of three sites in this whole region. This is not 
densely populated with ozone monitoring sites. Um, but, but it does fit this, this earlier analysis that I showed on this other graph by CDPAG that the high, elevate, the high ozone um, areas in this state are here the front range. And that's related to this transport. Remember all the, the wind roses I showed you? Where, you know, we got, um, <laughs> you know, we, we're really bold. It's really unfortunate. This is, you know, we should just move the city, you know, <laughs> move it either south or north or east. Yeah, this is about the worst place to be if you want to avoid oil and gas influence because we get this airflow. It's such prominent airflow, and especially in the summer in the afternoons. Um, so, and that's, that is reflected in the ozone records as well. Um, we don't really have much data from the eastern um, state. They just haven't been um, monitoring programs implemented in that area. Yes? Um, I had two questions concerning the December 22nd event. One is regarding the timing, and the other is regarding whether the data have been published. On the first, Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, pretty right. the back trace for the seven indicated that that air, if it did come from vicinity of Windsor, could have been there six to 12 hours, would have been there in Windsor six to 12 hours <laughs> prior to seven. If I understand that. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy and so proud. This is, I thought, how do I explain this? But I, that's, that's the way I understand it, you know? Okay. And so that would mean earlier would be some time between 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. when uh, the high concentration, if it were in the vicinity of Windsor, would have occurred. Uh, whereas the a public event uh, occurred like at 9 p.m. So it's not like there was like just an hour or two difference here. We take into the, the backtrace. The inference is that this data would show that From my understanding of how deep I've looked into this so far, and here I rely on trust in these back trajectories, which I don't do myself, and they have, you know, a certain certainty, but also certain uncertainty. Um, I think everything you said sounds reasonable to me, um, but I want to add to this <coughs> that the fact that we see this narrow window spike in the data at the border reservoir does not mean at all that this would have been a pulse release at a given location. This means that we encountered air at the reservoir for this length, length of time right. that was transported from somewhere where there was this release. This release can made it happen much, much earlier or for much, much longer. But it just Hap happened that the wind just shifted and we got flow right from there and we actually looked we looked at the back trajectories prior and after this event i showed three but we went way further out and we did see that prior the flow was different so we would even if they had been released in the winter region let's say we wouldn't probably wouldn't have seen it when the trajectory shifted where we were aligned with winter and then you know it shifted again after where we wouldn't have seen whether catch the smell is you know, uh, problematic, yeah. But and I don't smell it before it, uh, it happens. Yeah. And I don't know if this is from that explosion or you know, I'm just showing you you're welcome to make that conclusion and present it. I'm just showing you some interesting data I find really Yeah, some interesting associations. So. No, no, nothing. No, I, I, I did call CDPHG and told them, hey, look, we see something really cool in here. Have you noticed this? 
or do you want to take a look at this? And said, oh, yeah, we'll, I'll, t I'll tell my buddies. <laughs> so, and that was very recent. This, we just stumbled on that the last week while I was preparing this talk. Yes, please. Well, you know, me being somebody in air monitoring, of course, will tell you, yes, it makes sense to have air monitoring stations. Um, you know, I, I hope I communicated to you the value of doing this monitoring. And what we're doing at the Boulder Reservoir right now, I think, is the most ex extensive monitoring of oil and gas emissions ever done in this in the state, don't cite me. The state has been doing this in locations, but they typically only take a sample a week or something. Snapshots, you know, 3,500 samples now. I mean, it's only one side, only 10 months. But I strongly believe that there's high value in this continuous monitoring where you can see these events, where you can do the wind direction analysis. And, you know, part of the motivation for Boulder County to support this is you want to establish a solid, high-quality data set um, prior to the onset of oil and gas development within the county so that as this development may happen now, one could come back in five years, ten years and do a comparison study and have solid data to prove there have been changes, there has been an effect which then could trigger legislation. You know, without having high-quality uh, abundant data like that, you, you, you really live in a guessing world. Yeah? So my answer is yes, I think you know, to, to trace this, to track it, to direct legislation, I think this, these types of observations are, are really, really badly needed. And, and the more the merrier, you know, it's, it's, it's a cost, cost decision, you know, who wants to make that funding available. Yes. When my monitoring equipment become cheap enough that citizen science could Play a part in this kind of research. What I find very gratifying is um, the, the interest in citizens in our work and interest in citizens to become part of this and support the science. This is fabulous. You know, and I, I haven't seen this in the first 30 years of my career. Um, there's certain things, you know, I think where citizens can help. The dilemma here is that this type of monitoring requires expertise and instrumentation that you cannot get at McGuckins or online. And I think there has been a lot of misleading information out there, um, which is unfortunate. Um, there's this cheap sensors or low cost chambers hitting the market that claim they can you know help do some of this work i'm I'm highly skeptical of that because of how primitive these sensors are and how many site sensitivities they have to something else that's not really what they're meant to do. I think it can help you know to identify situations like that. Um, to trigger then a more sophisticated monitoring. Um, and I do not want to discourage that at all, but I, I want to caution um, that there's, there's, there's worlds between this type of monitoring 
and citizen science monitoring tools that are being advertised and, and being used by the community. Uh, want to do one more question? Was that good? Uh, yeah, I was going to suggest um, we're, we're over time, but uh, so any, I, I know, I know, I know. But I was going to say, anybody wants to stay um, as long as you're willing to stay? Yeah, I'm happy to stay and stick around. But I, I'd like um, to say that anybody but, else who has to get out of here, um, we can. Yeah. But actually, on a, on a on a brighter note, I was hoping to to to, to show you one a bonus slide because I think I think it's so cool. It's so cool. Um, let me see where is it. And something you know that that happens when you monitor, like the the event we saw there, which may have been linked to that explosion. It would never never happened if there hadn't been an established monitoring in place. Now something else happened. That would have never happened if we hadn't had this monitoring in place. So and you all got excited, and I was excited. I was in, um, in Nebraska um, when the solar eclipse happened, August 21st last year. Um, and I looked at, we looked at the data from the Boulder Reservoir. Um, this is ozone, and you know now ozone gets formed by the sun hitting um, VOCs and NOx. And in this graph here, this is that diurnal cycle of ozone. So the ozone, and the brown data is the mean data for the month of August in 2017. You know, ozone goes up during the day, it gets formed photochemically, and then it stays high during the afternoon and drops down again. Now on the eclipse day, in this beautiful, the sun disappears, and here at the reservoir, right outside our door, you know, ozone took a nosedive by about 10 ppb, even though it wasn't even a full eclipse here. And then it recovered. Um, Are you making a political statement? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't want to comment about that. <laughs> yeah, just to sh <clears throat> Okay. So, um, yeah, thanks for coming.